Here's the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, Jeffrey Goldberg. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, at the Atlantic Festival. I hope you've enjoyed what you've seen so far. We have even more for you. Uh, and right now, uh, I'm going to be speaking with Senator Ben Sass, Republican of Nebraska. Thank you for joining us at the Digital Atlantic Festival on our fancy set. Thank you. Uh, I yeah. wish we were at an actual embodied festival. One but day. Good to be with you. <laughs> One day there'll be a live audience in front of you. It'll be shocking. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll have you next year. I hope by then we'll be able to be back, uh, we'll be able to back live. Um, so let's just, um, let's just talk about American politics and the mood uh, in the country. Uh, what's wrong with American politics? And don't take the full 25 minutes to answer that question. Try to answer that in a minute. Premature and, elaboration. And then, and, then, uh, and then we'll go from there. But, but let's talk about, um, but, but, but lift all the way up <clears throat> and, and describe for us, from your perspective, um, as a, obviously a Republican, mid, uh, Midwest, heartland, um, but somebody who has veered in some fairly dramatic ways from what I would call you don't have to call it this, but I would call the Trumpian norm or the new Trumpian norm. Uh, give us a little bit of a diagnosis from where you sit. Well, you said um, pull all the way up. So I, I think that means we have to pull up above politics a little bit. And I think that is that we're living through a digital revolution. I'm a historian by training. And I think 100 years from now, when you look back on this moment, people aren't going to talk very much about Donald Trump or about politics more generally. I think they're going to talk about the fact um, that we're living through one of the most transformative times in the history of technology and therefore economics and culture. Usually a historian's job is to sort of trace change, continuity versus discontinuity over time, and usually it's a pretty boring job because people always think they live at an inflection point in human history, and really there's usually a lot more continuity than discontinuity. We just think there's radical change because humans are narcissists and we're at that moment. Um, but I think retrospectively we are going to think the change from an economy that's mostly about atoms to mostly about bits and how that transforms work is the thing that's happening in our time and place. So I think we're being unsettled from community. We're the first people in human history that are really going to see the end of lifelong work. We're going to have adolescent-like experiences in terms of identity crises for 40, 45, and 50-year-olds as you have to figure out what you're going to do for the rest of your life because the jobs you worked in were eaten by software. And I think that unsettling of community in place raises lots of fundamental questions about what gives people happiness and meaning and connection and neighborliness. And so I think almost everything that's happening in our politics is downstream from that. Can you describe um, the, the, the manifestations of, I would call it the cognitive revolution, but you can call it whatever you want, this, the, 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 the globalized linking of every human. I mean, and, and maybe talk about it specifically in terms of one tech company to keep it from floating off into total mm -hmm. abstraction. Um, the theory of Facebook was that it would be good to connect all human beings simultaneously and in real, in real time and, and instantly. Um, there were some people who thought, mm, maybe human beings shouldn't be talking to all other human beings all the time. Maybe that's a... There's, maybe there's a downside to that, but can 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 you talk about um, what you've noticed the 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 change the, the kind of change that's been brought about by social media revolution in particular? Maybe, but I, I I'm not sure I'll maybe be great you're, at you're, just you're saying, saying no comment. To no, that. I'm not not no comment. But I think I wish Neil Postman were alive because I think one of the great things that you find in you know, technology critics and media critics in the past is that they were good at saying whenever there's a change, there's both cost and benefit to this thing, mm -hmm. and we tend to want to be utopian or dystopian about all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, this new technology is going to make everything new. It's going to be, it's going to usher in the eschaton, or the world's going to end tomorrow because of this new thing. And usually, it's some of both. And I think um, just at the level of what new technology brings us economically, we are the richest people in all of human history at a consumer level. We get more high quality, cheap stuff than any median middle class society has ever been able to consume in history. There's a lot of benefit to that, but it also means that our identities, which are fundamentally linked to work, we're meant to work, we're meant to produce, we're meant to do things that benefit our neighbors, um, there's so much less certainty that any productive thing you do is still going to be useful to somebody else 
one month, one year, one decade from now. And I think there's a ton of angst in that. And the idea that what people really needed to your, I don't, I don't know if Zuckerberg ever really said it precisely that way, but the idea that linking everybody together would give you this ability to have all these conversations that would make everything you know, mm -hmm. heavenly, well that's just nuts. Because the main thing people want is a family the main thing they want is a few deep friendships. Where you go after work in the evening, I think work is fundamental to our identity and happiness, but where you go afterwards and whether or not there's somebody who actually wants you bodily present to break bread with them and say you're needed, that's infinitely more important than how many Facebook friends you have. I think there's some data um, that actually shows the more social media relationships you have, the less likely you are to know the person who lives two doors from you. And happiness is highly correlated to know the person, to knowing the person two doors from you. It's not correlated to having 500 versus 5,000 social media friends. I think what that really does is it expands your denominator for potential unhappiness. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're a little kid <clears throat> and your mom's, you know, setting up the house for for Christmas Eve or whatever holiday you're about to celebrate as a family, it's a pretty great thing when you're seven that you don't have awareness of some famine or war that's happening on the other side of the world because you're around that hearth with these people who love you and life is pretty dang great. Now, when you become an adult, you can't be unaware of that distant stuff, but not to sound like an ancient stoic, um, but you do want to be happy um, by making a meaningful difference in the things you can control. And there are people that I'm called to love that are right here or 20 feet away or 200 yards away. And I think we tend to have too much consciousness right mm -hmm. now of a global community and not nearly enough consciousness of an actual neighborhood around you. You're the current chairman of the Senate's Ancient Stoic Committee. Is that correct? It, it, yeah. I'm, I'm the chairman of a group of one. Yes. Um, could you link Contentious what you've, elections. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you link what you've just talked about to anger in politics? Sure. I mean, I mean, just maybe nut picking is a good place to pick up, right? <clears throat> Less than 14% of Americans pay attention to politics on a daily basis. A lot of people do that out of a sense of duty. So there's there's some thoughtful, engaged people in mm -hmm. that 14%. But by and large, those 14% are pretty weird. Um, the people who are making politics a primary community for themselves are displacing other communities that are more relevant today. But let's be clear, I'm, I'm of the Eisenhowerian one cheer for politics school. Um, you know, I, the idea that government is, is the enemy, which is just a sort of shorthand for lazy right-wing stump speeches sometimes, isn't true. Government is necessary to maintain a framework for ordered liberty, but it's mostly freedom from so that you're free to do all the stuff you're supposed to do in terms of your actual local callings. And right now there are a whole bunch of those 14%, and I think this is one of the places where Donald Trump is kind of illustrative more than causal. I think there's about 7 8% of America, that, let's, let's do a two by two matrix. And if you've got an X axis, which is ideology, and so you've got progressive, center left, center, center right, whatever we're gonna call the right in the future. The crowd out of the middle on that axis, the evaporation of the moderates, is pretty obvious in the data. Pew and Gallup, I think, say that in the mid-90s, about 26% of Americans defined themselves as moderates, and they were higher propensity voters than people right and left of them. Mm -hmm. Today, about 7% of Americans define themselves as centrists or moderates, and they're less likely to vote than people right and left of them. What has caused that? Is this just social pressure, tribalism? What, 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 what is that? that? What is that that makes <coughs> radical centrism uh, so irrelevant in the conversation right now. So I'll answer you first, but I want to make sure we have the oh, framework the of where we're going next. Yeah. Let's, let's do a y-axis of political engagement or attention uh -huh. for a second. We'll come back to mine, but stay at yours for a minute. Um, I think in a world where it's more 1870 than 1900, if, if we're living through a digital revolution which is transforming the nature of work, and one of the only analogs to it would be industrialization and urbanization in the late 19th century, cities were pretty dang uninhabitable in 1870. By 1910, they were nice places to live. But you went from having lots of thick community and social capital of the Tocquevillian agrarian village, um, and people knew each other, they had common cause, they had purpose, and they had a consciousness and identity that was about things they could largely control. What was happening way off in distant politics didn't capture their attention most of the time. But when you move to cities with early industrialization because of push and pull factors, pull to factory, push from agriculture that had become so much more productive with new technologies, you didn't need as many people to do it, 
Ultimately, cities became habitable, but it wasn't politics that got us there. It was the rebuilding of a lot of social capital in those cities when you arrived. And I think that sense that you're living through a disrupted period, 1870s New York, Boston, weren't great places to live. By 1900, 1910, they're interesting again. I think if we're living through a, revolution, a digital revolution, the nature of work, sense of identity related to productivity, there's a lot of sense that people are helpless, and so then you want politics to solve this distant, disrupted challenge, and politics isn't well equipped to do that. So I think the ev evaporation of the center is partly ideological as people look for politicians right and left to solve their problems. But I think the bigger issue is this y-axis of attention, and that gets to your point about social media and the way we engage, the way we get our information or our news. If your y-axis is political engagement, the middle evaporating there is a much bigger problem than the middle that's evaporating ideologically. And I think the upper tier is political addiction. The lower tier is disengagement. And the middle tier is like normal people, middle brow. I've got a duty to be engaged as a citizen, um, but I don't want this to be my primary community. I care about my neighborhood, my co-religionists. Right. I care about my sports right. team loyalties. People who want their main tribe to be people who happen to share their same politics, they're pretty weird. <clears throat> and I think we have media consumption that is now everybody who wants to pay attention to politics thinks they need to do it as an addict or they need to disengage. Mm -hmm. And so I think the middle of America, again, in terms of attention middle, is disengaging because they don't want to be a part of this 14% that's addicted. Can you, I don't want to veer away from this totally egg-headed conversation because I'm enjoying it. But can you talk about... Like the Stoic caucus of yeah, seven? The, yeah, the Stoics meet the eggheads. Um, they walk into a bar. Um, the, could you talk about this in the context of your constituents in Red State, Nebraska? You know, sure. we, have, we all have possibly distorted understanding of the Trumpian movement because we watch video <clears throat> from rallies and we watch January 6th uh, video, obviously, and... Um, you know, it becomes our impression, or my impression at least, that that the the boiling anger in inside the the core of the Republican Party is has become really toxic. What are you seeing in Nebraska that cuts against sure. the understanding that the majority of Republicans now are these hyper angry white ethno nationalist resentment based? Uh, anti-democratic almost uh, a, a kind of voters who are going to, by 2024, really threaten the nature of our democracy. Is there anything that you're seeing on the ground among the Republicans of Nebraska that says, you know what, most people are actually not all in yeah. on that? Well, I mean, I, I feel like I might sound like a broken record on this, and I annoy some of the Capitol Hill press corps with it, but the way we cover politics as short-term tribal reaction to reaction to reaction, it's nonsense and the vast majority of people don't want anything to do with it. So I don't mean to sound self-serving about it, but I'm by far the largest vote getter in the history of Nebraska. I'm one of nine people in the U.S. Senate who's never been a politician until I ran in 2016, 2014. And I just got reelected in 2020. And I had a Trumpy primary. I got 76% of the vote. Um, when I was getting primary, that was really newsy. When I got 76% of the vote, it was no longer sexy. In the general election, I got the most votes anybody's ever gotten in the history of Nebraska, despite President Trump telling people to not vote for me um, three or four weeks before that election. And I got censured by the state Republican Party of Nebraska and by the um, county GOPs. There are somewhere between 120 and about 400 people who are really active in state politics out of a state of 2 million. And I get censured by the party. I voted for impeachment uh, in this after the January 6th moment. And so I got censured repeatedly for that. Those censures are news, but the fact that I set the all-time vote record isn't news. The vast majority of people don't want to do politics like this. I had a reporter shove her iPhone into my ribcage in early August on Capitol Hill saying, you've been ducking us all day. I was like, really? I, I didn't know you were looking for me. My team's pretty good. If you reached out to my office and I didn't respond, I'm sorry, but that's not like us. Tell me more. What am I ducking you on? And she was, you know, winsome and high EQ, so she de-escalates. And she goes, I don't mean you're really ducking us. It's just, we want to know. And she, you know, references some other folks on the press corps with her. We want to know, what do you think about what Matt Gates said, about what AOC said, about what Marjorie Taylor Greene did? But I don't give a shit. Like that in a republic, nobody should care about that. You just named three people who aren't serious adults. 
They don't actually have an agenda for 2030 America. And the reason I ran for re-election is because I'm worried about the future of work, the future of war, the First Amendment culture when a world that moves to primarily digital rather than in-person public squares. Just let me just push back on something. You say that they're <clears throat> nonsense and fine, you know, or they, they're, they're ridiculous, not serious people. Uh, you're talking about people who can and already have in some ways instigated violence, violence that can tip our society into some kind of dystopian new reality. I mean, how do you, fine, I recognize that Marjorie Taylor Greene is not the norm in, in, uh, among elected Republicans. Nor, but, nor is AOC the norm, which is why she got eight votes when she tried to take down the Iron Dome funding, and yet the press acts like AOC, not all the press, but it's very typical to act like AOC speaks for like 60% of 51% of the country? That's nonsense. It's just these people are really good at doing short-term screaming. Is it, I'll come back to the violence thing if we have a moment, but, but or is what you're saying that, 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 it sounds like you're saying that the press and sort of social media echo chambers are creating this <clears throat> idea that, that the extremists uh, really have much more power over ordinary maybe active, actively engaged citizens, but ordinary citizens, than they actually do. And Absolutely. so that it's up to the press? No, I don't mean that. I think we're going through a, a revolution of technology that makes us consume in different ways. That well, we used to have three channels, not everything was great about that. You couldn't watch the, I couldn't watch the college football game you wanted to watch. Um, but in the late 1950s, I Love Lucy had something like a 68% weekly share and a 91% monthly share. I Love Lucy wasn't important content, don't mishear me, but it was shared content. And so to the degree that technology and media consumption habits have both pros and cons, we should recognize some of the cons. Um, in the, my oldest kid is 20, in her entire lifetime, the most watched programming in America was Sunday Night Football for three weeks in 2014, hit a 12% share. We used to have a world where a lot of times there were 70 and 80 and 90 percent issues people could talk about in common. Now, when a really high watermark is an 8 percent or a 10 percent or a 12 percent moment, the political addicts become another niche. But that's not what the American public wants. I'll cite some polling from last summer. When you ask the American people, do you identify more as a Republican or more as a Democrat, and you don't give them a none of the above answer uh, option as an answer, it still wins. 46% of the public pushes back on the question and says, I don't like any of those people. Mm -hmm. I don't want those parties representing me. I think it was 29% lean Democrat, 25% lean Republican, and 46% say, screw you, that's a dumb question. I don't like those people. Our politics are overwhelmingly anti-politics, and the clickbait ways that we respond to it implies that people are actually for a far left agenda or for your ethno-nationalist right wing agenda when they're not. Most people are voting against the opposite extreme, not for something. We need a politics of vision, not a politics of grievance. Last question for you, and it's a large question, and you have to answer it efficiently. <laughs> then what's like the way out? Like the last out? few questions. Yeah. What's, the way, what's the way out of this? I mean, we're heading toward a... Uh, toward an election. We have now the precedent of a president of the United States denying the reality of an election result. We haven't really had that experience. Um, that, as you well know, is filtering down, maybe not into the average Nebraska voter, but at the state, at the county level, the people you're talking about who are censuring you. Um, this, this is becoming a new norm, it says, if you lose your election, don't consent to the loss. You know, and, and all of democracy hinges on the willingness of the loser to concede to the winner. So, so how do you, what, what's the off-ramp for, 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 for all of this before we hit this 2024 moment that, that could end up on January 20th, 2025, with two people claiming the White House, which has a very kind of, you know, non-democratic vibe to it. <laughs> Well, well said. Uh, okay, let's speak to the point you're making procedurally about democracy over the last year and over the next three. But I still think from where you started, Jeff, we have to go up one more level because the political addiction conversation is not actually representative of what people need or want in a long-term republic. Uh -huh. But to your point, I think I've been pretty clear um, that the election of Joe Biden, I acknowledged him right away that first week. <clears throat> and then... 
when the new president or when the the outgoing president um, said all the nonsense and now is conducting and trying to get other states to conduct these audits which continually show um, that Joe Biden won the election people telling the truth is really essential to the maintenance of republic we just don't do basic civics enough so that the vast majority of Americans don't even know what happened in 1800 and why it was so glorious that John Adams willingly vacates the White House and Thomas Jefferson takes over and folks in Europe say, well, that must be fake news. There must be some <laughs> myth because nobody's ever willingly laid down power before. You couldn't have this Cincinnatus moment. And the glories of, it wasn't January, I guess it was March, right. um, 1801, <clears throat> pardon me, as Adams leaves office and allows Jefferson to go in. That should be a moment that all American school kids celebrate. It should be a basis of patriotism. The most read document in American history until the Civil War, after the Bible, but the most read political document in America um, wasn't the Declaration of Independence, wasn't the Constitution, it was Washington's farewell address. Right. And the idea that in 1796, Washington would plan to explain to the American people and his you know, former revolutionary soldiers had the Society of Cincinnati to celebrate this idea of willingly laying down power, that belief is predicated on understanding that political power is not the center of life or identity. Right. In a republic, the only way things actually work is if there's a broad-based understanding of meaning being somewhere other than the mm. seats of political power. Well, we, we have to wrap, but let me just <clears throat> stay on this for one more second. I just want to know, what what is you're a political leader. What is the way out of this? You're, and you're right, to, to borrow from Saddam Hussein, the mother of all norms in America is that politicians give up power peace, peacefully. How do you keep your party from becoming anti small democratic? Well, first of all, there aren't political parties in America right now. There's only the last guy who won. So I'm not, I'm not doing sort of um, false symmetry here. <clears throat> but the idea that there's some mandate, you and I decided, or we were kicking around as this interview started, how much time we'd spend on current events uh, today. But this idea that there's a mandate for radical change in D.C. in a country where the American people just decided to elect Joe Biden president and to give the Republicans the majority in the Senate, and then Donald Trump decided to go to Georgia and make sure that Republicans lost our majority. Donald Trump stole the majority from uh, the Senate Republican majority from our party by electing Democrats in Georgia because he wanted to say the lie that he... Uh, won the election over and over again, and it turns out voters didn't want to do that. Suburban Republican women in Georgia decided to elect Democrats to the Georgia Senate seats because <clears throat> they were tired of Donald Trump being on the stage lying that he won an election that he didn't win. So it would be worth recognizing that the American people decided to flip two Senate seats in Georgia because they didn't want that to happen. But now we pretend, or regularly there's talk on Capitol Hill, that acts like there's some mandate for the largest legislative package, at least since the Great Society programs of the 60s and maybe since the 1930s. That's not true. The American people don't want this $3.5 17-issue area reconciliation bill. And yet people do that because they misread anti-politics as a mandate for something. Another thing we could do is we could celebrate the fact that Mike Pence told the truth on January 6th and refused to participate in these things. It turns out lots and lots of Republicans don't actually want that kind of frenzied addiction to the moment which says power is the only thing that matters. What most people want is to have a democratic republicanism that is stable a decade into the future so they can figure out how they're going to navigate work disruptions and help their kids plan for a world where we're going to have to create a civilization of lifelong workers. We've, we've not been very good at having the long-term conversation, and a republic is sustained by those healthy middle-brow people saying one cheer for politics. Well, we could go on, but we can't. <laughs> We're not allowed to. We have to move on to the next thing of the. We're, we're submitting to Charles, the, your your assistant here, who decided we have to end the interview in 25 minutes. Also called you an Amish rock star yeah, when that's, we were that's, kicking that's off. Decon, that's deeply decontextualized, and we'll talk about that privately. Uh, but I, I wanted to thank you for coming to the Atlantic Festival, and we'll see you on stage. I hope live in front of a live studio audience next year. Thank you very much, Senator Ben Sass. Thanks, Appreciate sir. it. Good to be with you.